another episode of the podcast with uh, Ryan Flynn, fresh off of a uh, brother Ryan Flynn, fresh off of his appearance at Esotericon 2021. Welcome. Happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. So you are another uh, one of my guests, which I've been lucky enough to have, who also presented at Esotericon. I'll leave some links up in the corner of, of some of the other guests uh, I've had. You know, Ben Wallace, uh, Mitch Horowitz. But it is great to have you as well, uh, Brother Flynn. I see behind you, I don't know what it is with you esoteric cats, but a lot of you seem to have uh, skulls located on your bookshelves. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm actually in my studio, which is, you know, I, uh, I, I built an art studio this year um, at my house. And then I, I slowly realized that I built this huge room and I've only put all of my art stuff in one corner and turned the rest into like a lounge, <laughs> which I, I'm not sure was the, uh, <laughs> the ideal setup for me doing all my art. But I, yeah, I built my bookcase in here. And then um, I actually have the skull because... I used it in a prop for a couple of paintings. So I just have it here and stuff. So I'm not, I'm not one of those uh, Hamlet reenactors pondering over, uh, <laughs> pondering over the skull a lot, but it looks cool and creepy. So I keep it up there. Uh, you know, let's start <laughs> with that. Yeah. You mentioned your studio and, and you're an artist. Uh, talk to us a bit about your artwork. Um, is it posted anywhere for people to see, you know, is it, uh, do you sell any pieces? Tell just talk about your, uh, your, artistic uh, endeavors slash artistic career yeah well okay um well yeah so um i kind of excuse me i didn't realize my phone was still on i apologize about that that's embarrassing uh, uh, it, happens. <laughs> it will not happen again um so yeah no uh so I, I was always artistic my whole life you know i was kind of the art nerd in high school <laughs> i didn't uh didn't go to any parties and stuff i'd rather just you know sketch and draw uh <laughs> You know, so I was definitely the social king here. But um, yeah, I, uh, I had become a Mason in, in 2010. And um, by some fortunate thing, this cosmological event in my life, um, I was placed in a position where I could design some stained glass windows for my lodge at the time. And um, I ended up designing these, these like 14 foot tall stained glass windows that we, we actually printed. We didn't make them out of glass. Uh, because I had learned how to do stained glass. I just didn't have the funds or the, or the shop to do it. So um, we ended up just actually like heat transferring them right onto plexiglass uh, and it lit up the room. It, it kind of went crazy overnight. And, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> a week later I was getting interviewed about them and, and it, it kind of like took me by surprise. So I, uh, I started realizing that there was this history of the fine arts and Freemasonry, and we had abandoned it uh, collectively. I don't think it was on purpose, but we abandoned it collectively about 30 or 40 years ago. We just stopped doing it. So I kind of took it up on myself to, to become a Masonic artist and, and to produce art that was, um, I want to say, honorable to the craft. I, I had felt that or I think a lot of people agree with me when I say this, but the square and compass has kind of stopped being the three great lights in masonry or two of the three great lights in masonry. Uh, and now is more like a logo. Like it's like, Hey, it's our Nike swoosh or it's our BMW propellers. We just slap it on anything and anything we can, we can print with a square and compass on it. And we call it Masonic. And uh, I decided that that was going to be the complete opposite of what I wanted to do. So I started uh getting back into painting and, and painting stuff about like the actual deep parts of uh, and the esoteric parts of masonry. And um, it's just weird. It's just kind of just, just happened. And now I'm painting everywhere and getting commissions all over the place and just loving, loving life. <laughs> so. Do your commissions come from Masonic lodges? Or are they just, uh, uh, yeah, well, like, like if somebody wants to, to get in touch with you uh, about commissioning a, a painting, how do they go about doing that? Um, yeah, so they do come from lodges. Um, I, I've only had a couple that were from a lodge. So my biggest commission that I got um, square footage wise was uh, my lodge. I, I belong to another lodge with Ben Wallace down in North Carolina called Blackmore Lodge number 127. It's in a little hole in the wall town called Mount Gilead, North Carolina. And I, I um, 
muraled all the walls and it was this huge project and it took me like seven months to plan uh and in a very very long 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 weekend to, to paint it all uh, i was kind of on a marathon run because i had to work around my flights but um yeah with commissions it's it's weird it's it's picking up now, you know, I'd have Masons ask for one thing here, you know, a portrait of our grand master or a portrait of a past master. I've done that a lot. Um, but then I started painting more like the stuff I wanted to, and it's been, it's been getting, getting fun. So a lodge that I can't mention just commissioned me to do the four cardinal virtues for their room. So I'm working on those right now. And um, after that, I have someone who wants me to do faith, open charity. So um, the people can reach out to me. Um, I have a website, ryanjflynn.com, and uh, I'm very active on Facebook and Instagram. So they can find Ryan Flynn Artist or Ryan Flynn Studios on Facebook. And you can see I always take pictures of all my work as they're going, going through the progress to make sure that everybody knows I'm not doing paint by numbers. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the easiest way to, to get a hold of me. You mentioned... Um... Uh, you you want to work on art that is honorable to the craft or to the square encompasses, as opposed to uh, I don't know what the word is logification commodification of of the yeah. the square encompass more more honorable to the, the meanings you know however a mason defines them individually um, and more in general then. Because uh, this isn't something I've really discussed with the esotericon speakers, you know your your views of either Masonic symbolism or Freemasonry itself, you know, depicted in popular culture. Uh, I've done a few episodes on where me and a buddy of mine, another Mason, uh, Igor Strukin, where we watch and review movies, TV shows that depict Freemasonry. Most, you know, every Freemason, uh, I think their favorite Simpsons episode is Homer the Great. So we have reviewed that one, the Stonecutters episode. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, but the first episode, the first piece of pop culture I chose to review because it's one of my personal favorites is uh, the movie uh, From Hell. Oh Starring yeah. Hell. I'm yeah. very, very fond of that uh, movie. I like it a lot. I like the atmosphere of it. Igor was fine reviewing it. But he, you know, half jokingly said, "This will get us kicked out of the craft for sure." Because <laughs> if you've not, uh, if you've not seen that movie, spoilers. You yeah, watch yeah, absolutely. It. Right, but spoilers: uh, the Jack the Ripper turns out to be a Freemason, not necessarily working in conjunction with the Freemasons, but the, the Masons are not portrayed necessarily in the best of light in no, in no. the film. Yeah. Yet I love it, and I have, you know, if for the purpose of a story, um, the Freemasons are to be the villains of the piece, I'm fine with that. I don't, I don't mind that at all. But there have been other brothers who have expressed concerns about either that movie or more in general, some of the more conspiratorial uh, minded people, you know, portraying Freemasons in a yeah. not so good light. So I guess as, you know, are you of the opinion you know, of all press is good press or uh, just what are your thoughts about Freemasonry as depicted in pop culture, whether for good or, or not so good? Well, I mean, if you really think about it, we're an introspective group. So we don't really make good Hollywood stories. Like we're, we're not going to sit through a two and a half hour movie of us like sitting, talking about ourselves and thinking, you know, it's, that's not going to get you a lot of awards and a lot of box office tickets. So, I mean, you can take any aspect of life and, and culture and you can see it being twisted to make a story. Um, you know, like there's always a way to entertain with people. I really don't have a problem with that. I, I, I think you have to be able to laugh at yourselves a lot. I, I think the Homer Simpson Stonecutters episode is funny as hell. <laughs> like they really get us good and we should laugh at ourselves because if you take yourselves too serious, so you're never going to, you're never going to grow up and you're never going to learn to, to really appreciate it. You know, that's one of the great aspects of humanity is our ability to get to a point where we're so comfortable with ourselves that we can just, you know, laugh. 
you know, like take, I can take a joke. You can call I'm a heavy guy. My, my best friends call me fat all the time. And you know what? I laugh when they do it. You know, it's just the way we do it. Um, when it comes to Freemasonry, you know, um, I'm not upset when other people make fun of us. I'm upset when we fulfill the stereotypes. That's, that's what gets me. So, um, you know, having a movie like from hell where we're, you know, supporting a serial killer of all things, um, is, is just as outrageous as, you know, um, Nicholas Cage movie there, uh, National Treasure, where we're hiding all this treasure underneath New York and no one seems to find it. They're both extremes that have nothing to do with it. Um, but what I do have a problem with is people who wear a square and compass on their shirt and go on social media and then make stupid comments like we're riding the goat this tonight and we're doing all this stupid crap that like people just want to believe that we do. And that demeans the craft. I think, I think there is a very fine line to do it and it has a lot to do with an intent. Um, like I said, I can take a joke. Uh, I just think if you are a Freemason and uh, you plan on poking fun of the craft, which you're very much allowed to do, you should be very uh, upfront about you doing that for specific reasons and not doing something that could be taken as this is how juvenile we are. Um, and unfortunately, you know, with social media, um, you know, for every two or three people who are sharing the good word and, and uh, showing us what we can do, there's there's 400 guys who have never picked up a Masonic book screaming at everybody else saying, this is what we really are. And it, it gets old really quick. Um, and, you know, the other thing about it is with with uh, the media is, you know, some you can get a lot of good out of it. I mean, Dan Brown's book you know, attracted a lot of good Masons, even though what's in the book is utter nonsense. Um, but, you know, it, it, good press is good press. You know, all presses can have a positive spin on it. But, you know, I know a lot of people who, I know one instance, for example, that uh, a brother was brought into the lodge because he watched National Treasure and the people who are bringing him into that lodge who have since been expelled from the craft we're, we're playing along with that saying like, yeah, th that's what it's like. You got to come in here and, you know, it got out of control and, um, you know, the kid, the kid was taken advantage of. Um, so um, it's a fine line, but we can't be too worried about what other people are doing, you know, re represent the craft as best as you can in your life and realize that you're not perfect and strive to be better. You know, the, uh, I mentioned at the start, you know, we are fresh, as of this recording, we are we're fresh off of Esotericon. Mm -hmm. Esotericon 2022 is a year away. I left some, you know, pictures up on my socials of um, the date and, and where to go to get tickets for it. Uh, it's going to be terrific to be back in person, but just talk in general about your experience at Esotericon 2021, uh, how you found the all virtual format and then you know your uh presentation at that event yeah so um those guys are awesome like joe ben, like it's weird it, i've been traveling to different lodges all around the country and outside the country a few in in canada um for nearly seven years now um and one of the great things about being asked to speak at a lot of lodges is you get to meet these guys. So um, you meet people like Chuck Dunning and, and Ben Wallace, and they're instantly your best friends. And um, the guys who run Esotericon, you know, Joe, uh, all the guys down from, from Virginia, and then people who come from Chicago, like RJ, and, and you know, you meet all these people from, from all over. And um, it sounds kind of corny, but it's almost like we're in our own little micro lodge that's like unofficially meeting whenever we can. And um, it's truly a, a brotherly love experience when we're all in the same room together, even if it's digital, we just, everybody loves each other. And I really mean that. Like, I don't mean like, Hey, you know, I really mean it. We love each other and you can feel it when you're in that room. So just being invited to speak with those guys is just, it makes me, 
anxious to be part of that thing. Um, so this year with the all virtual, obviously because of COVID, it, it kind of threw a, a um, monkey wrench in it, but uh, they, they, they rocked it. You know, they, they, they took care of business and it, it went off without a hitch. And uh, the presentations were phenomenal, like phenomenal. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I can't wait to do it again. It's, it's going to be a little weird for me next year because it's going to be in person and I'm running MasonicCon in New Hampshire next year. And that is the week uh, before theirs. <laughs> so it's going to be two, two Masonic events within a week of each other. So it's going to be a little hectic, but uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome. If people, um, if people haven't experienced it yet, even especially for a virtual event, like you can't miss it. You can't it take a day out of your life to experience it and then bring it to your lodge somehow. Yeah, I, yeah, I spoke with um, Brian Simmons of Ezekiel Bates Lodge and he mentioned, you know, Masonic Con will be New Hampshire bound next year, which will be another terrific event right there there's a few of these floating out through i think texas has one mm -hmm. uh, chicago so the, these are growing i don't know of any in canada off the top of my head uh, do you know of any in, in canada i don't any know of any in canada yet i i know like certain grand lodges in canada have um like masonic days i was supposed to actually go to uh uh vancouver in 2020 for their their grand masonic day and then covid killed that which was kind of bummed about it. I've never seen the Pacific Ocean, so that was going to be like a, a little thing for me. And uh, you know, I've met guys like Troy up there who are just great guys. And um, but yeah, it's it's growing. Brian started it, and um, it's just a ama it's amazing how it's blossomed. And it and the, the beautiful thing about them because I've been to a lot of them is each one has their own like attitude, like atmosphere. So you'll go to Esotericon, for example. And, you know, it's, it's got this vibe to it. And then you go to Attleboro and it's just like a big family cookout with, with Sonic events once in a while. Um, and um, at the same time, you're getting all this, this knowledge out of it. And um, what Brian started is people are going to remember this for decades. I really think because he didn't realize it when he was doing it, but he was bringing masonry into the 21st century and he was doing it with a steamroller and not just a little, you know, push from behind. The so these Masonicons, um, or yeah, you know, and, and Esotericon, the one thing I've really tried to emphasize through this podcast, through just my work with Square and Compass, through my work with the Windsor Masonic Temple, right, is. Uh, and this it kind of, in a sense, is the opposite of, of the esoteric side of things, but we'll get back to that. Uh, you know, is the economic benefit that a Masonic lodge or temple can bring to its, its city? You know, uh, if you look, so the Windsor, Windsor Masonic Temple is celebrating uh, 100 years this year. And if you go back and you, you read the newspaper from 1921, and not just for Windsor, but for the Detroit Masonic Temple opening, for all these, these temples, you know, they were, the opening events were, whether it be the turning of the saw, the laying of the cornerstone, these were incredibly well-attended events. And, mm -hmm. you know, the vast majority of people attending were not themselves Masons or connected to the craft. They were excited because, you know, the, the erection of a temple presented a, economic it was a sign of economic growth and opportunity for the city you know if you're a small business owner you could you know if you you could look at catering or providing services to the temple like it, it mattered to the local economy and i think that's one thing we've gotten away from you know we've become a bit too insular in that respect uh, something like in um, the sonicon you know in new hampshire next year right that's for a, a struggling tourism industry you know, Masons and their families coming from nationally, internationally, mm -hmm. that's, that's hotel rooms booked, that's restaurants booked, that's, you know, this can be a significant economic benefit to a city. And it's just one thing that, that I think is a real shame, but that 
things like Masonic Con can bring back is, you know, if a, a towns and cities should be excited about the possibility of a Masonic Lodge or Masonic Temple opening up, it should be a big deal because it can, if it's run well, provide economic opportunities for that city. And I think a Masonic Con is just an example of that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and, you know, I think that there's another benefit to it now is with, um, you know, masonry shrinking right now and uh, we're, you know, we're losing membership like crazy. Uh, I'm firmly under the, uh, the belief system that this is a good thing, um, that we got too big and we got too diluted and uh, a lot of the things that we were known for in the past weren't happening anymore. So when I hear like stories, exactly what you're talking about, like with your, with your temple being built a hundred years ago and like the town showing up to see it, you know, back then the Masons were a staple of the community, you know, like it, the, the movers and the shakers of, of a town were in that lodge. Um, and I've heard that story countless times. And um, now we've gotten to a point where, you know, a lot of places, the Masonic temples, that old dilapidated building down the street that you see a couple of guys in tuxes walk into once in a while. And you really don't know what's in there. You know, everybody, I've never seen the inside of a building. I heard it's pretty, that sort of thing. And, and having, um, for example, Masonic in New Hampshire, we're, we're having it in an unbelievably gorgeous building. So the M Manchester Masonic temple is one of the largest uh excuse me, it is the largest temple in New Hampshire. Um, and it's, it's gorgeous. And it's right on the main street of the biggest city in, in the, uh, in the state, which in New Hampshire doesn't mean a lot, but uh, um, we, we have different definitions of city, but um, not only is it going to bring people to the community, I mean, we're planning on having it end early. There's a, you know, there's a whiskey bar down the street that we're going to have a room for at night so that we can go there. So they're going to get income from us. Um, you know, we're going to have food trucks, hopefully, so that they can get business from us. Then we have places for vendors to sell stuff, too. So if you, you're a member of the community and you're, you do crafts or you do some sort of service here, you know, give me a couple, you know, like peanuts and you'll get a table and you get to meet all of these people. Um, so I think it's going to be good because with the direction of masonry moving in a more, um, I want to say, spiritual and, and fraternal way going forward, this could be a big like coming out party for, for Freemasonry, especially in a New Hampshire. And um, I'm lucky, uh, I'm lucky's understating it. Uh, I'm extremely fortunate to have a, a grand lodge and a grand line um, that is just like, tell me what you need. <laughs> you know, no, no, uh, no roadblocks at all. Like just, just how can we help? because we know how big this is going to, or how big this could be for us. So um, it's good. And yeah, I, I think you, you, you nailed it by saying like it, it, it can be, and it should be a community event, not just a Masonic event. The, the never ending uh, membership debate that you touched on, you know, I've, I'm thinking more and more that the it it the, the problem with I think that that I think it slightly misses the the mark. I, I was always of the opinion for a long time that growth in membership was you know of of critical importance <laughs> as I call of my coffee of critical importance because it, I just viewed it from an economics angle. Mm -hmm. uh, being in, in a, a city like Windsor, where we have the Windsor Masonic Temple, you know, you just, you take, okay, what are the expenses of the building versus, you know, how many members do you have? And then the more members you have, the, you know, you go you, you from that way. But I think to a greater and, and greater extent, I've, I've come to think that it's a slight miscalculation. I don't think Freemasonry needs to focus on increasing membership. But I do think it needs to focus on increasing uh, supporters or fans of, of the craft. So I've come to very much like the, the analogy of mixed martial arts. Uh, you know, when the UFC puts on an event 
or Bell or whatever it is, Bellator, or you know, they they push out their McGregor's, their Poirier's. They're not trying, they're not trying to get other MMA fighters to, you know, buy tickets. They're trying to get the general public. They're trying to show, yeah. hey, this is something that the general public will be interested in. I mean, when Joe Rogan, for example, has Dustin Poirier on, right? The vast majority of people watching that interview are not themselves MMA fighters. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, as Square Encompass grows, I hope that the vast majority of people watching this podcast are not themselves Masons. Um, but what happens is, right, when you, and, and you saw this with, with the way MMA went, as the number of people who respect the craft of MMA grows. So, you know, you have a, a stadium filled with 100,000 people, right? All, they're not there because they necessarily want to be fighters. They're there because they respect the art and the science and the craft of the fighters. And they recognize, you know, the skilled endeavor of this thing. They, they care about it. And of those 100,000 people, you know, a certain percentage will join a local gym and then a certain percentage of those will stick with it and become the next McGregor for you. And it, it creates a, a system where it self-perpetuates. And even those who don't, they, you know, the tickets that they purchase, uh, the merchandise, whatever it is, they support, they allow people like Dustin Poirier, Conor McGregor, wherever it is to become the best fighters in the world. And I think, you know, Freemasonry is not a spectator sport per se, but it is, you know, things such as this podcast, um, things such as Esotericon, you know, Masonicon, there's lessons and, and, and value in the craft that can be communicated to the general public. And if it's done so in an entertaining and a fun way and a professional way, you know, you can get, you can find a way to monetize it. The greatest thing about the, the best thing about social media is, you know, you can monetize almost anything. You can say that's the worst thing too. But for, you know, the purpose of this, I mean, this is an individual podcast. I started it, but there's no reason why a lodge that's struggling couldn't theoretically start a podcast, start a Patreon page, you know, and then if they're producing good content, you suddenly you have 50, 100, 1,000 fans of Ezekiel-based lodge. And then they're providing income to it. And then that allows them to do more in the community and more for the craft. So this is just a long-winded way of saying, um, I do think that Freemasons need to focus on recruiting, but not recruiting members. They need to focus on just recruiting uh, fans, people who respect the art and the science and the craft of Freemasonry. And then the membership will take care of itself, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you to a point. So I would say that the different, where I see it being different, I'll start there, then I'll move into how, how I agree with you. Um, so the place I see it being different is, you know, um, using any sports analogy, you know, a sport is, is to be done in public. And that that's kind of the goal of it is everybody look at this so I can get, um, so I can make money basically. But, you know, masonry, at its purest form is a secret. So um, promoting something that's secret is, is kind of a, is kind of a, a delicate balance of how to do it with respect, as you said. Um, but the way I do, I do agree with you is, um, and I'll change it just a, a little bit is I think if we promoted the ideals of what we do and not specifically what we do, um, that we could go down that path where we're gaining recognition and, and quote unquote fans from it. You know, I like to say um, in one of my presentations, uh, and I'll just use the arts, for example, because that's what this presentation is for, is, you know, the, the Masons used to support the arts and, and, and drama and literature on a scale that we just don't even come close to anymore. But what better way to tell, um, you know, the world that we support the arts is to like, not talk about it in secret, but go to a play together, go to a concert together. You know, what's a better advertisement for Freemasonry? I know that's the A word, uh, you know, a billboard or 20 Masons with their significant others going to a show, 
together, you know, and having a good time and being respectful and, and just being out there with, you know, out there in the community expressing what Masons stand for. Um, I think, I think there's a way that that can be done uh, that goes right along with what you're saying. And that is kind of what we do with Esotericon. Esotericon's great and Masonicon's great because it's promoting Freemasonry. But Freemasonry doesn't own the lessons that we do. We're, we're just the bucket that all of this stuff came into and we turned it into Freemasonry and that's how we process all of the stuff that we're putting into it. Um, but we can promote uh, these ideals to the public very easily. I've, I've always tempted with the idea, this is something, someone's going to steal this now, but I'll let them. <laughs> Um, I've always had the idea of having like a public Masonic, uh, Masonic event where we brought spiritual leaders from three different major religions and come in, we, you know, we take a Christian, we take a Jew, we take a Muslim and we take, you know, some, someone who like a Wiccan, there's something else out there. And we sit them in the same room in the public and we talk it out and we talk about stuff about, you know, how we can coexist, what, how can we support each other and stuff like that. I think doing something like that is is kind of what you're what you're talking about rather than you know the selling the t-shirts to get money just so you can watch people pound each other which i i, I get your analogy and i don't mean that literally of course no, yeah no i i understand maybe the core um and and I think the core distinction, I think if you want to drill down to the very core of it, um, I think that the, the distinction that we kind of need to draw as Freemasons, and by the way, I think this applies to almost every civic group and religious group, churches uh, are experiencing something similar too, is or um, there are there are titles that are skills based and there are titles that are membership based and the whatever it was once upon a time and people can there's a whole healthy debate on that i would say in 2021 and for the last say 50 years the, the term freemason has really been membership based being a freemason means you have a a card in your wallet or nowadays on your phone which, you know, I am a member of such and such a lodge. And you could very well have never attended that lodge past you know, when you got your first degree, uh, especially in, in North American jurisdictions. There are some jurisdictions that have attendance requirements, like the Philippines, mm. but not here. So you could have got your first degree, pay your dues every year, um, and, and never have attended again, and you can still call yourself a Freemason. Whereas a skills base would be mixed martial arts, even music's a great example. You know, I can purchase a membership to my local mixed martial arts gym and I'm sure they'll take my money. Um, but, you know, uh, I could call myself a member of Gold's mixed martial arts gym, but I certainly wouldn't be able to call myself a mixed martial artist. Mm -hmm. Or if I tried to call myself a mixed martial artist, I'm sure I would rightly get my ass kicked by a legit <laughs> mixed martial artist who was actually putting the work in. And I think the thing about a, a the, differ the difference and why it matters is because a skills-based endeavor is able to, again, it's, it's the type of thing that is able to develop and grow respect in the community. Um, if, if something's membership-based, like that's the struggle I have with this podcast. When, when people hear it's a Masonic podcast, like, well, I'm not a member. So why would I be interested, mm -hmm. right? But if, you know, trying to change the conversation, say no, being a Freemason is actually a skills-based endeavor. It takes years, decades of hard work and regular attendance. People are like, well, I, I respect skills of any sort, cooking shows, musicians, right? The vast majority of people consuming music, cooking, mixed martial arts are not themselves cooks, they're not themselves mm -hmm. mixed martial artists. They just respect these skills. Uh, people I find are really respectful of, of skills in any endeavor. 
Mm-hmm. They, they may not be, I can't play music to save my life, but I love listening to it. And I even love watching musical podcasts or watching behind the music, right? It's, yep. and I think if, if just if Freemasons are more expressive of that idea, this is actually about, you know, to be a true Freemason in the truest sense of the world, it is a, a skill-based endeavor that takes a long time and a lot of hard work. That will will change not only the way Freemasons themselves view the craft, but that will change the way the public views the craft, and it will help it gain more more fans, more respect, and then that leads into you know people want to partner with the temple, they want to you get more positive community relations in a skills based endeavor as opposed to just an insular membership approach. I I cannot agree with you more. Um, and, and I think part of that is, or part of the issue that's causing this is that, um, and I'm going to be very judgmental here. So sorry to all your fans, if they're like, all right, this guy's an asshole. Uh, but, um, you know, we've turned the degree process into roll them out as fast as we can, so we can get the dues card and, um, that, that stage to get to the, the title of master Mason is really now just like a wait list. And, um, you know, I, I, my lodge uh, is a TO lodge. So we actually, you have to put in work in between your degrees before we just give you, you, you have to write papers and do presentations before we allow you to get to the degrees. Um, but um, I think it's exactly how you said, like the skill set and the work that gets you to that skill set is, is not valued enough. And when you put people who don't value that, out there to be the voice of the fraternity where where it's either by position or by who's loud enough on social media which you know is most of it um the, the, a lot of problems will come up with that and you're going to lose that respect from from the uh from the outside world because the people that should be getting the attention for being freemasons are being silenced by the ambient noise of the others who are just claiming, look at me, look at me, look at me, because how cool I am, because I have this ring that I got 90 days after I signed my petition, you know? Um, and, um, you know, like it, my home lodge in Nashua, we have like a past master. Um, I can actually name like three past masters who are staples of the community. And people know that they're Masons. And people know that they will bend over backwards for a complete stranger because that's the kind of character that they are. And those are the people I want representing the craft. I want more people like that. I'm not saying we're all going to be saints. Like I, I can be a jerk pretty good. <laughs> Ask my wife. Um, but, uh, you know, like it, it's that we... And I don't think it's a masonry thing, as I as I think out loud. I think it's like a society thing right now. It's just like whoever's loudest gets the most attention, and um, that that determines the um, you know the first uh, what's the word I'm looking for first impression of the lodge or, or what Freemasonry is is usually going to that that loud person who's on social media who is really talking out of their ass, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I think I, I completely agree with what you're saying about like that being the face of Freemasonry and, and going through the content rather than the membership to judge it. So, yeah. How would you define um, for any newer Masons or even Masons who are you know, not new, but, but maybe fallen off uh, of attendance or involvement? How would you define some of the defining, the defining skill set that will make a a quality uh, mason? So I actually do uh, a presentation on this that goes over pretty well, and I think the best way to define Freemasonry is to it, it, what the ideal Freemason is is um, is by the term Mason. Like let's let's think about like what a stone mason was in the Middle Ages. So and what masonry was. So you're building a temple, right? It's all these different blocks, for lack of a better term, being put together to build this big edifice that's dedicated to God. But each one of these blocks are individual, and they're all reductive in nature. So 
a Mason will take his rough Ashler, figure out the good part that he wants to see, that he that's inside that Ashler, and then use his skills to the best of his ability to knock off all the unnecessary stuff until it gets down to something that's useful. So masonry is completely different to every every person. I don't think there's a definitive def, uh, definition of what it is to be an ideal Freemason. I think the ideal Freemason is someone who can look at themselves and see that there is a rough ashlar in the mirror, see that inside that rough ashlar is a perfect ashlar. We're never gonna get to it, but it's there. The, the potential is there. And the willingness to look at oneself and say like, you know what, there is stuff in my life that I need to knock off and get out of here so that I can be a better person. And if I become a better person, I'm going to be part of this much bigger plan that'll build and erect temples to God. And those are the people you find who are like, in my opinion, the Masons, like a true Freemason is that person who is constantly working on himself and constantly rearranging how he sees himself and realizing that I am not God's gift to the craft. I might have something wrong that I need to work on. Maybe we should focus on that instead of talking about how awesome I am. And I think it's, it's the attitude. Like that, that's what sets people apart. And, and everybody, you can see it, you know, because I was one of it. I will freely admit, you know, I shot through my degrees. They're like, memorize this. Got it, buddy. I'm going to memorize this. Pissed, you know, pissing off my wife as she's watching TV. And I'm just reading my cipher, going, you know, talking to myself and, you know, like just annoying her as much as possible. Shot through my degrees, got, you know, after the degree, slipped the ring on. I'm here, guys. Look at me, how awesome I am. And then two or three years after that, I started realizing like, hey, maybe this ego of mine is not the goal, <laughs> you know? And, and the way you kind of discover that is traveling. I mean, it's no coincidence that the, the um, you know, the great reward you get for becoming a third degree is the ability to travel. Like now go out there and find yourself. So uh, that's, that's kind of how I describe it for most people now. Yeah, no, nothing is, is more important to a, a Masonic career than travel. I would say if I had one piece of advice for a new Mason or any Mason, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't be lazy. Uh, just, mm. you gotta be traveling. Your, your Masonic career will be so much less. Yeah. You know, we'll just be so much less if you're not. Uh, there's so many times when there's really no excuse to, to not travel, especially in a place like Windsor. Or Detroit, I, where you can have multiple lodges, but they meet at one temple. So you're not even having, you know, you, you compare that to, say, the Northern Ontario jurisdiction, for example, which is Lodge in Knorr, and then it's like a three-hour drive to your next lodge. You know, here, it's all the same building. Like, leave your, leave your, leave your suit at the temple and change here <laughs> is one of the, you know, is, is a trick. And, and you know, but... Yeah, it's it's the same building. Just it's a different night of the week. Just show up. You can do it. Don't be lazy. You're you're going to get so much less from your Masonic career by not traveling. Yeah, and you know, like you, you can't learn about the world by watching one channel on TV. You know, and um, and um, you know, one of the great things about this is, you know, most of for you know, obviously there's outriggers, but you travel around the country. We all have relatively the same ritual and if it's not the same ritual it's the same point just said differently and um when you get to see it in different jurisdictions especially if you're you're not just arbitrarily traveling like hey lodge a is having a business meeting today i'm gonna go to that like that's that's one form of traveling and that's great to build relationships but i think real masonic travel is when a lodge is putting on something that's special and you go out of your way to go to it. Like I'm going to drive four hours and stay in a hotel room and I'm going to meet new people because they have a national speaker come in here and they seem like they got their stuff together. And, you know, I'm going to get something out of this or I'm going to go to Masonicon or I'm going to go to Esotericon or, and now with, with the virtual stuff, you know, listening to a podcast is, is Masonic travel in my opinion. Like you're, you're getting something new and you're getting it from a good source. So, um, 
you know, just keeping that, that, that targeted traveling going is going to change you and your relationship with the craft overnight. I, I can't stress it enough. Uh, yeah, I will, I will push back a bit on the, the, you should for sure. I, if a lodge is putting on a special event and you can get there, you really should because the lodge is going to any amount or some brethren in the lodge, usually the same ones over and over again, are going to a certain amount of effort and work to put on that special event. So you taking the time to travel there, it's not just, at that point, it's not just about you. Uh, it, it is about you showing support for that lodge and the work they're doing and saying, like, this is a good thing you're doing and it's worth me traveling to see this speaker, to yep. go to Masonicon. Uh, but I would also say, though, you, you know, don't underestimate to any to anybody who's looking at traveling. Um, so even though, for example, yes, the the ceremonies are the same, you know, you, you get so much from from hearing somebody else hearing another lodge perform it. Because I'm sure, you know, if if you are in your lodge and you're at your hundredth, two hundredth meeting it can become very call and response and you just, you, you go through the motions mm -hmm. going to a different lodge, maybe their opening, the, the, they're emphasizing different words. The person okay. who's doing it um, has a, has a different gesture or what something there's always, even if the word is the same, the emphasis is different. The way mm -hmm. that they will pause. And there's been many times because I'm not, Ashamed to say that there's been many times when I've been visiting uh, a simple business meeting and there's uh, a piece of ritual done and I've never heard it done quite that way. And then I'm more than happy to steal that and bring it back to my lodge. And when I'm oh, yeah. doing the ritual. So, uh, you know, even if it is just a regular business meeting, uh, you know, if you can get there, you get there and just pay attention because you will find something if nothing else, from a purely selfish perspective, you will find something worth stealing. Uh, yeah. The, my, the analogy I like to use is like, uh, and I'll ask you the question here. I'll turn turn the tables for a second. What's your favorite cover song? Oh, gosh. Uh, Simple Man, probably. Shine Down. Yeah, yeah. But I do yeah. love the original. Yeah, I'll but love. so I'll ask you, um, same words, same notes. But what sticks out differently in that in that cover song more than the, you know? That's a great analogy. I'm going to change it though, actually. Um, All right, yeah. Because um, I just I love the original Simple Man so much. Uh, yeah. I'm going to go with um, Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's by Heart, uh, cover of the Elton John song. And the reason is, um, oh, we just talk about hours. <laughs> of, uh, I love Heart. Yeah. I love Alan John too. I love the lyrics to that song. The, the, the reason I love the, the heart version um, really is uh, just Nancy's voice, right? It, 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 everybody knows heart. As, you yeah. know, they're, they're both amazing singers. But I think something about her voice brought just a whole new dimension to, to the song. Uh, and also the fact that, you know, uh, Elton John is British, obviously. Mona Lisa's is a, a love song about New York City. But, um, you know, to have that song sung from an American perspective, I think is a really interesting thing, too, because it's it's just the, the perspective that brought to it, but also just her voice is so incredible. And I think it brings something so unique to that that song that wasn't in the original. Yeah, I see. I, I'll, I'll even go with heart again. Um, you know, when I if you want to talk the power of, of uh, a different perspective is watching Hart do uh, a stairway to heaven live at the Kennedy center honors. And you see Led Zeppelin crying <laughs> because they're listening to some song they have sung thousands of times, literally thousands of times, but that different perspective, the different emphasis, you know, seeing Bono's, I mean, uh, Bonzo's son on the drums, like, 
it was different. And, and it's, it's the same, like I said, it's the same notes, it's the same words, but there's something amazingly different about it. And that, that difference is so powerful that the guy who writes the song is tearing up listening to someone else do it. And, and that's exactly like the analogy I was trying to get with, with ritual is, is it's just, as you said, like you'll go to someone who maybe has a, a personal experience or something in their life that makes them latch on to one little part of ritual. Um, you know, my buddy, Chris, he, he has gone through some stuff and the closing charge is his baby. And you listen to him do the closing charge in any lodge. And it's like, you heard it for the first time. You know what? He was, uh, he was my secretary when I was master and I would, I'm sorry, buddy, you're doing it. <laughs> like I want to hear it every time, even though it's my job, you're doing it, you know, delegate. Um, and it's just, you, you hear those, those emphasis is that are, that are coming from a very personal space. And you, again, that comes with people who are, who are dedicated to this. You know, um, you'll you'll get the people up there going and just mouth it off, and they've never looked up a word that they're reading, and you know that that can that can be damaging. But you find where you want to travel to, and you find people like that, and one little emphasis can change your entire outlook on on something you've heard a hundred times. Uh, in terms of other uh, pieces of advice, even you know, very, very, uh, what could seem simple or, or small. I mean, any, any advice you would give for proving uh, somebody's Masonic journey, even something small, like one, one piece of advice I always give is most jurisdictions still use paper membership cards in most lodges. There is a, a, an effort underway I'm trying to get more information about it to switch it to electronic. Uh, how many.com, I believe it is. Anyways, but, yeah. but by and large, most lodges still use paper cards, which I personally think is better at the moment. Um, but one suggestion I would always give is as a Mason, you have a paper dues card. You also have a grand law certificate, which has your certificate number on it somewhere always write down your certificate number on the back of your dues card. Uh, it's a little thing, but it will make your life so much easier, especially if you're trying to log on to your Grand Lodge's website and you're not carrying around your certificate with you, I would think. So you need that number somewhere. And also if you ever, heavens forbid, lose your certificate or right, you've got the number right there and you can get a new copy. And if you ever lose your dues card, you know, it's just another back and it's a small thing, but your dues are charged with you. So that's just a small piece of practical advice I'd give. Yeah. You know, and there's other ones too. Uh, keep a journal. Like if you're a crazy artist and keep forgetting your wallet and your laundry and wash it a couple of times and you have to... <laughs> that would never have... <laughs> well, a crazy artist. But uh, just in yeah. terms of... You know, to, to any Masons watching this, uh, especially in Ontario where we haven't had a meeting in person and a year and a bit right now it's looking like september knock on wood uh just what what type of advice would you give for for yeah, how brethren can improve their masonic experience um hmm. there's a couple things i gotta pick one um so i'll say this so when you look at our landmarks they all you can look at them as rules but you can also look at them as protectors. Our landmarks have set up a room where men can come together, not be um, affected by what society expects from us. You're in a safe space. I hate that term, but I'll use it. <laughs> um, you're in a safe space among people who are your brothers. Don't be afraid to become vulnerable. That's my biggest advice utilize the gift that has been given to you and try to be, try to take the lessons as best as you can. And the other piece of advice I'll go with that is no matter what form of education works for you, some people get more watching a movie than they do reading a book. I'm like that too. I, I, I'm a visual learner for every 
hour you spend getting education, spend three hours thinking about it. That's, you know, sit down, have a drink with a buddy, talk it out, think about it and get something out of it. Because I could, this is me speaking. I could personally care less if you can name all the Sephiroth of the tree of life in Kabbalah. I great. Good for you. What I really care about is you taking that and treating fellow human beings like a decent person, (laughs) you know, so contemplate and bring it into yourself. And that's where you're going to see the change. Let's uh, let's end by looking forward to about a year from now and New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, give, give a shout out for that. Any Masons or for that matter, non-Masons who, you know, are, are interested in Masonicon, um, you know, what are we looking at in terms of tickets, locations, uh, websites, all that good stuff. I just based on my experience at Masonicon this year, uh, I have no doubt, you know, it's, it's well worth a Mason's time. And uh, if for no other reason, I mean, even if, you know, not, nothing else, you know, New Hampshire, beautiful place, right? So get yourself to Masonicon if you can. And how do people go about doing that? Yeah, so uh, we're, we're, we're in the early stages of, of developing it right now, but we're about to have a website, which I don't have the name for yet, because why would I be prepared for this? Uh, but we do have a Facebook group right now that says Masonicon New Hampshire, so you can go there for now. Um, but yeah, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be the first weekend in June. Um, we're going to be utilizing our space. As I said before, we're, we have the largest Masonic temple in New Hampshire. Um, so we have you know four lodge rooms. Um, and so things are going to be going on at the same time. You're going to be able to choose which speakers you want to listen to. Uh, we're working on having a degree happen in the afternoon for people who want to attend that. Um, and then of course we'll have a big festive board and all that stuff. Um, so I would recommend right now finding the Facebook page, uh, Masonicon 2021, New Hampshire and getting on there. We're going to be building the website soon. We're, we're actually having a planning meeting next weekend to really get things in motion, you know, have laid our budget down and and stuff, but uh, national speakers, local speakers, um, I will not speak. So there's a point to sell ticket right there. So, (laughs) Um, but yeah, it's, I I cannot wait to have this happen in New Hampshire. It's, it's going to be a blast. Are there, uh, you know, in terms of of travel, there are hotels close by the temple, like, um, Oh yeah. Yep. So there I assume is pretty easy. And then, you know, I, I think you mentioned too, right? You'll, you'll be partnering with some local establishments as, as well for the yeah. event. So the good thing about Manchester is we have our own airport, but we're also like just over an hour from Boston. So you can fly into Boston too, or you can fly right into Manchester. So that we're going to have hotels. Um, Manchester has plenty of hotels, plenty of bars, plenty of everything like that. So you want to do um, what we are going to try to do is the Sunday uh, which is a little hike from from Manchester, but we'll we'll figure out how to get people there. New Hampshire is lucky enough to have the the tavern where our Grand Lodge was formed a couple hundred years ago still intact, and the lodge room is still there. So you go into this uh, 18th century tavern over in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is right on the water, uh, one of the oldest uh, towns in America, and you go into this tavern walk up these old rickety stairs, well, not rickety, we fix them, but you go up these old stairs and you go upstairs and there is a uh, 1700s lodge room, which we still use. So we'll get some members over there to do it. And um, it it is really cool. When I was master of my lodge, I I got to do a degree up there, which was a little tight, but (laughs) but, uh, it was worth it. So we're going to probably do something like that too. But um, yeah, we're, we're working all that stuff out right now. We, we still got about a year to go. So um, you're going to start seeing more formalized things come out in the next couple of months. Um, like I said before, we are so lucky. My Grand Lodge and the Grand Line is just like, how can we help? How can we help? How can we help? And I know I'm, I know that's making people jealous, but <laughs> it's, it's so awesome. I, we got such a group, good group of guys up here. Well, keep that in mind. That first weekend in June well worth a trip if you can uh the other thing that it's well worth doing is 
hitting the subscribe button, the like button, the comment, all that good stuff. Give me money on Patreon if you want. Um, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. All the words you say about this type of stuff. Oh, and I'm on Clubhouse now too. That's fine. So uh, yeah, do all that good stuff. And then one more time, uh, Brother Flynn, just throw out there, if people want to contact you regarding your art or looking to commission something or get, you know, get some ideas for the either Masonic or non-Masonic art, or even, you know, art that, you know, incorporates Masonic motifs. Uh, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah. So um, my website's ryanjflynn.com. Um, and then no, be back in the description to the video. Oh, thank you. And then um, I have a Facebook and Instagram page um, that I, like I said, I share all in progress things in my work and you can contact me there. Um, those go right to my phone and yeah, I'm easy going. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have uh, another, our next interview with Esotericon speaker is in July. So this is the last one of this series for a while, but thank you so much for taking the time both to speak at Esotericon, uh, which I, it was terrific just to be a guest and attend and see those presentations. And also uh, you taking the time to speak to me today. No problem. And I can brag to Ben and Joe that I didn't mention Florence once in this. So <laughs> yeah, we'll leave that. That's a mysterious thing. More <laughs> fun to leave it a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. This, this was awesome. It was really great to, to finally talk to you and I'm sorry it took so long to get to here. So.